Hello, I'm Dave Grossi. They've been called America's greatest generation. Young men, some as young as 15, who put aside the most formative years of their life to help defend freedom during World War II. Years that should have been spent going to baseball games, attending college, going out on dates, but instead they willingly put their lives on hold, put on a uniform, left their cities and towns for parts unknown, in essence saved America from the tyranny that was spreading across Europe and that had indeed come home on December 7th, 1941. This is their story. The Department of Veterans Affairs estimates that there are fewer than 1 million World War II vets still alive out of the 16 million that served during the war. And the VA also estimates that well over 400 die every day and that by 2036 there will be no World War II vets left. You're going to meet some of these incredible people now. Listen as Staff Sergeant Bill Pace, a Purple Heart recipient, recalls his story about how he was forced to bail out of a B-17 bomber five miles up over Germany when his plane was struck, and then how he spent the last few months of the war in two POW camps in Germany. An Army PFC Lloyd Rausch, who helped liberate the infamous Dachau concentration camp, and Staff Sergeant Mario Grossi, who helped liberate the notorious Woblin concentration camp. They'll describe for you the horrors, the sights, the smells that only a veteran who's been there and done that can describe. Army hero Tech Sergeant George West, recipient of the Silver Star for Gallantry, and he'll relate how his citation calls when he became a one-man patrol when his unit was almost wiped out in Germany. You'll be spellbound by Navy veteran Vic Bucket, one of only a handful of survivors of the USS Indianapolis that was torpedoed by a Japanese sub during a top secret mission delivering the components of the atomic bomb that helped end the war in Japan. He'll describe for you his experiences during his struggle for survival over four days in shark infested waters watching as over 600 of his crewmates drowned or were eaten alive by sharks when their ship's distress signals were ignored. Their stories will undoubtedly invoke many emotions pride, sorrow, even anger. But as our film progresses, I'm convinced that those emotions will compel you to watch and listen. For several of these vets, it's the very first time they've related their wartime experiences, but they've all agreed to be part of this most important historical and educational project. Hear now as these heroes tell their stories of their years spent in Europe, the Pacific, or in critical duties stateside. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bonita Springs Historical Society is proud to present Bonita's Greatest Generation in their own words. Uh, I'm Myron Kratzer and I'm a uh, veteran of the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers during World War II. I was in what was referred to as the Special Engineer Detachment, I believe, SED, of the Corps of Engineers, and that was a name given to the group of people, probably roughly a thousand, who worked uh, uh, as staff members at the Los Alamos uh, plant, uh, the Los Alamos project for developing the atomic bomb. I was 19, I was 18. I it was about uh, two weeks after my 18th birthday, I joined the Army, volunteered for enlistment, as it was referred to at that time. Uh, but I had volunteered earlier to enter what was known as the um, as the weather program. The there was no Army Air Force at that time. There was an Army Air Corps, yes. and uh, the Air Corps had a program for training weather officers. And uh, as a college student at Oklahoma University, I I volunteered for that. Signed up for it. Was accepted and uh, received instructions about what to do and those instructions told me to report to my nearest uh, enlistment uh, center and uh, enlist and I did that about a week, two weeks I would think after I was 18. I probably was a PFC, PFC when I got there 
And uh, as I mentioned, I ended up as a tech sergeant, but uh, never married, so we lived in the barracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there were roughly, uh, I think roughly a thousand GIs in similar circumstances. Actually, it's not generally known, but the, the GI component of the technical staff was actually the majority of the technical staff in the lower, with a few exceptions of, of uh, some very senior scientists who happened to end up drafted or otherwise in the army. Uh, we were the, we were the lower levels of the, the the working stiffs, but we worked side by side with the civilians who, for one reason or another, were not in the army. I had when I, by the time I left, I had two or three civilians working for me. I reported to civilians, not to army officers, but to civilians. And uh, it was completely integrated between the civilian staff and the military staff. In fact, the deputy, of course, everyone knows that the director of the project was uh, Robert Oppenheimer. But my recollection is that the deputy director was a, uh, was a Navy captain. So it was an integrated operation between the military and civilian. And the contractor was the University of California, which continued to be the operating contractor of Los Alamos for many years. And that three month period from March of 46 to September, I was an employee of the University of California. They probably can't find my records now, but I was. I started college at 16 at o University of Oklahoma and was uh, in, into my second year. In fact, I nearly finished with my second year. And uh, Pearl Harbor was uh, in 1941, shortly after I, I started college in uh, September, probably, of 41. and. Uh, Pearl Harbor was December, so it was a short time after I started, and of course, from that time onward, we were at war, and everyone was was considering what they should and wanted to do during the war. Uh, so I, as I say, uh, signed up for this Army Air Corps weather program. What was your major in college? Chemical engineering. Okay. I uh, was accepted. I went to basic training in uh, Fresno, California. Uh, waiting for the school, the, the weather officer school, meteorology school, to put it in modern day terms, uh, to open, and it never did. Uh, what had happened was that it was like many army, like many wartime programs, not too well conceived, not uh, too well planned, and they had signed up far more people to be weather officers than they could possibly use. So by the time they got around to me, two years after the war had started, I was, the schools shut down. I was sent to uh, Stanford University where there was a uh, program of people in my shoes, in other words, people who had no assignments. <laughs> and uh, we were tested and interviewed and tested and interviewed. You were PFC, uh, a private or PFC at the time? Uh, or? Probably just a private, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was, uh, selected to go back to college and continue my studies of chemical engineering as a GI at uh, Ohio State University. And uh, about a year after that started, in fact less than a year, uh, I started that probably in September of 43 and by March of 44 we again were subjected to a series of interviews and so on. No tests, I don't believe, but lots of interviews. Mm -hmm. And our entire class of chemical engineers at Ohio State University, um, with one or two exceptions, which we didn't understand then, but we did shortly afterwards, uh, was sent to a place that we never heard of and which was not on any maps, and it was Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Oak Ridge, of course, was one of the three big centers of the uh, Manhattan Project, the atomic bomb project, which we didn't know the name of or the purpose of at that time, at that stage. Uh, once again, we were interviewed, and our class of roughly 30 was divided about in half, and half of them stayed behind in Oak Ridge, and the other half of us uh, were sent uh, to what turned out to be Los Alamos. The handful, it was less than a handful, maybe two or three students in that class who uh, were not 
brought into the Manhattan Program, into the Atomic Bomb Project, were students who had close connections uh, with the foreign uh, government, with foreign countries. Their parents, uh, I don't think any of them were foreign born, but their parents had been, and uh, for security reasons, as we ultimately realized, they just weren't included. And I was sent to Los Alamos, and uh, it was probably, probably maybe April or May of, uh, of uh, 1944. Uh, it had been an operation at that point for roughly a year and uh, within a few days after being interviewed once again about what did I want to do, what were my talents and so on, uh, I was assigned to a group where I learned uh, the full purpose and, uh, of our assignment. And the purpose was, as you know, to, uh, to uh, develop atomic, the atomic bomb. Uh, I was not directly involved in the bomb development. I was in a small group of uh, chemists and chemical engineers whose job would have been to recover the extremely valuable, irreplaceable material that the test uh, weapon uh, contained if it didn't work. <laughs> so, of course, it did work. and. Uh, so that particular assignment was, uh, it was an insurance policy, and that particular assignment was uh, terminated. But I had already begun a new assignment, which was to recover this very valuable material from the waste products that were generated when the actual bomb was uh, fabricated. And all of that took place at Los Alamos at that time. In other words, Los Alamos was the center of development, but it was also the center of manufacturing of the atomic weapons in the earliest days. It eventually, it, because it never was intended to be a manufacturing location, that, that function was transferred elsewhere, but uh, we had a small plant where the bombs were actually made, and I worked in that plant. Uh, this was after the use of the bomb in Japan, and I continued working there until my discharge from the Army in March of 43, uh, 46 rather, and then I, uh, I uh, continued as a civilian with exactly the same duties, same job, until the schools uh, began their fall semester in 1946, and I returned to Ohio State University. The Corps of Engineers, which is part of the Army, but a kind of a, uh, an unusual part of it because most of its duties are not military but civilian. They, they for example, run all of the, uh, of the uh, levees and so on, they, all the levees that are supposed to control the water at uh, New Orleans but didn't, <laughs> yeah, right. are part of the Corps of Engineers. And the Corps of Engineers is organized in districts which are named for parts of the country where they each uh, each unit, uh, each uh, component of the Corps uh, operates. And there's a New Orleans district and so on and so, f so forth. So they, I think, were just looking for a name for the project and they chose Manhattan because there was no Manhattan district. I don't think it was any more sophisticated than that. It was a code name, in other words. Yeah, sure. And we never said the Manhattan Project uh, when we were there. We didn't think of it in those terms. We knew we worked for the Manhattan District, but uh, if we had a nickname for the project, I, I can't recall it. We just worked on the hill. The hill was the generally understood term if you went to Santa Fe, uh, that you worked on the hill. Yeah. Well, I was, I learned within a week of uh, arriving at Los Alamos as a GI that that was what we were doing. and. Uh, I don't think that my memory is playing tricks on me. I really am fairly certain that I understood then that if it was successful, it would end the war. I, I, I had a close friend, we had similar careers also from Oklahoma, and uh, I, I recalled saying to him, it'll be over in a week, and I was off by a few days. Wow. Was there was one test which was, of course, famous called Trinity, which was the first uh, uh, nuclear bomb, nuclear explosion. Of course, it was not a bomb because it was uh, not dropped from a plane or anything of the sort, but uh, it was a test that proved 
that the atomic bomb would work. And that took place in southern New Mexico at a site that uh, from that time onward has been called Trinity. It was on the, uh, it was on the territory of a big uh, testing grounds, which is still there, not for d nuclear purposes, but just general uh, defense uh, weapon testing. And um, the day after the test, which I did not attend, but my immediate boss did, uh, we all learned that it was successful and there was a period of great uh, excitement and, uh, and joy at, uh, in Los Alamos because of the successful test on, and I, this is a, one of the dates that I remember, but most people don't, <laughs> July 16th, 1945. And of course, roughly a month later, the first uh, bomb was dropped in, in Japan on Hiroshima. Yeah. And uh, several days after that on uh, Nagasaki, and then the war ended. Mm -hmm. And we felt then, and uh, I still feel, that that's what ended the war, and uh, that many lives, both American and Japanese, were, were saved. Yeah. We continued to make them right at the moment that they were the first two were used. We were, we were continuing to produce, and that never stopped. Yeah. Well, it has stopped now, but for many, many years, it not only didn't stop, but greatly expanded. Yeah. That's when I went back to the Atomic Energy Project in 1951 uh, because uh, the, the country and the military and Congress and so on had decided to build a new, very large plant for uh, producing the, the basic materials at the, in New Mexico, rather in the South Carolina. And I worked for a, a year in uh, Wilmington, Delaware on the design of that plant, and then I transferred to South Carolina uh, and worked at that plant, uh, not as a not as an operating person, but as a super as a government employee overseeing the design and construction for a year, and then transferred to Washington, where I remained until my retirement. Mm -hmm. No, we did not know. I, at the level that I had, and of course it was a very junior level, we had no knowledge of the deployment to the bomb. Uh, looking back on it, I understand why it was done, and uh, I know there was a lot of controversy as to why did you do it twice, but I think it's clear that unless it was done twice, the Japanese would uh, would be inclined to think, well, they just had one and then continue fighting. It took two to make them understand that that was one. <laughs> Those were the first of many and not just uh, the end of the road. Yeah. Now you say you were discharged, but, uh, but you continued on as a civilian in the same I did. Project. I did. Same job, same location, right. Did you ever give any thought to staying in and making the uh, Army a career? Oh, well, not the Army, no. But I did intend to make uh, I did intend to make atomic energy in my career, and that changed my whole life because it has become my career for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And how long did you stay at Los Alamos before you went to uh, Ohio State? Oh, that was a short time, from March of 46 till September. And I resumed college and completed in December of 1947. And at that point, um, I had uh, become uh, I had decided to get married, <laughs> and I returned to Tulsa, where I'm from, and uh, worked for three years uh, in the oil industry as a chemical engineer, and that's the only time in my life when I haven't been directly connected with the Atomic Energy Project. Yeah. So the assignment to the Los Alamos Project changed my whole life. Our parents didn't know where we were. We could not inform them, and our mail was censored. And uh, we, were, we could go to, to Santa Fe. Los Alamos is maybe 50, no less than 50, 30 miles from Santa Fe. Were you escorted when you did these outings? Are we allowed to go? Uh... No, we weren't escorted. No, we could just go down there. I mean, Santa Fe was well aware that there was a project which we all referred to as the Hill, Los Alamos. They didn't know what it was, but uh, it was generally known that there was a project up there. and. Uh, we could go into Santa Fe, and that was the limit of where we could go without special permission. Yeah. If after working three years in the oil industry in Oklahoma, I decided I wanted to go back to the Atomic Energy 
uh, work. I communicated with my last boss uh, at Los Alamos and got an answer from him uh, uh, from Washington. And that's, uh, and he asked me to come to work for him. Uh, not in Washington, but on one of the projects that he was familiar, uh, responsible for, and I did that and uh, continued working in the uh, atomic energy business thereafter. And I had a lot of contact uh, for a while with people that I actually knew in Los mm -hmm. Alamos, but mm -hmm. of course over the years those are pretty much uh, dissipated. In fact, there aren't many of us left. Okay. okay. Robert, thank you very much for your service and thank you very much for participating well, thank in you. this project. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it and enjoyed meeting both of you. Thank so you. long. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you've enjoyed this program. It's been both an honor and a pleasure to help these vets tell their story. And the Bonita Springs Historical Society welcomes your comments. I'm Dave Grassi. Thank you.